So this is um, this is probably one of the key sessions from all of this. The safety element is obviously a massive subject in solar cleaning. So um, yesterday afternoon, I actually lost all these slides because the file went corrupt. So very kindly, two of the IWCA kept me out smoking cigars and drinking whiskey till 2 a.m. So I had two hours sleep, and between 4 a.m. and now, I've rebuilt the whole of this presentation. So we're going to cover a lot of material. I'm going to be going at a quick pace. I'm going to say straight from the off that during this session, you're not going to learn every single process of how to clean solar panels safely, okay? This is what the ISCA training courses are for, all right? So what I'm going to do today is raise awareness of the risks so that you guys, when you leave here, you know what you're looking out for. And then when you do the training, that's when you get your certification and when you learn all of the processes that you need to do in order to stop yourselves from getting blown up, okay? Certain points, um, we've got some videos that we're going to show. We are going to show them, but before I show them, I'm going to warn people because they are graphic. They do show electrocution, they do show death, okay? So we're going to watch some people die as a result of BC electrocution. So this is not all sunshine and rainbows this presentation it's serious it's important we're going to have some fun along the way but when it comes to that bit i'll just warn everybody before i'm going to show those videos so start your engines here we go so yesterday for those of you that were in the room with me spoke a little bit about my credentials just to wrap this up in a neat little nutshell 26 years window cleaning experience and working at height experience so i am one of you guys carla with all of the data i mean she's she's not like us is she you know <laughs> girl loves a data so uh, you know so i'm I, carla's amazing absolutely fantastic i'm like you guys you know i'm not a researcher in carla's fashion i'm used to being out on the tools and up and down on the roofs i've got 10 years solar clean experience i'm iosh and aes trained they're two sort of high-end training courses that we have in the UK. Um, I've also got rope rescue training, so if one of my guys isn't doing his job properly and falls through a skylight and everything else, then we've got rope access systems that I'm trained in order to hoist him back up. Um, about 50% of our staff have that sort of rope rescue training. It's not essential work, it's not essential training that we have to do in the UK, but I think it's pretty important though that if you've got guys working on roofs all the time, that they are able to rescue each other. So that, that's really important. And then as I mentioned yesterday, we've got local and national awards as Clean Solar Solutions. So I'm taking off my Clean Solar Solutions hat today and I'm putting on my ISCA hat because we're going to talk all about the training and safety. Um, so Solar Energy UK, I sit as chair of the UK Rooftop O&M Working Group. O&M stands for? Operations and Maintenance. Operations and Maintenance, very good. Uh, 2021, <coughs> I co-authored with an, another um, load of industry experts and I released version one of the best practice manual for the UK. And then in 2022, we did version two of that manual, which is the front page of there, and that went out to Europe. So my experience in this sort of safety realm is, is not small, it's considerable, I guess. And so the information I've got to share, I feel, is, is valid. The reason I put those slides on is because one of the things that I get hammered when I talk about this um, safety is a lot of people say, well, you know, who are you? You're just a panel cleaner like us. And they don't realise that I've got all this other voluntary background work that I do for the UK industry back home. So I don't necessarily publicise that I do all this, but I suppose that's why I get a bit of flack every now and then. So <clears throat> the global sort of panel cleaning outlook, I'm going to whiz through these slides. So just the, the 2012 figure for Global PV install was less than 80 gigawatts. Um, there's now places like uh, India that are installing two gigawatt solar farms. So globally, there was only 80. Now we're just doing one side with two gig. It's a huge amount of, um, of solar that's been installed globally. The solar panel cleaning global outlook. Uh, we estimate to have total installed capacity. So yesterday I hit five points that folks were writing down. This is number six. A little bit of solar phraseology if you're going to get into this industry we're teaching you the glossary so total installed capacity is called TIC T-I-C so TIC total installed capacity um, will be 1.6 terawatts by 2030 the global solar panel cleaning market is estimated to be worth 1.6 billion dollars by 2026 which is now only like 
less than three years away. So anybody want 1% market share of that? Yeah, yeah I'll take that. How much turnover is that gonna give you if you've got 1% market share? 16 million dollars. That's a tidy amount to be to be turning over. So there's a lot of money in this industry. You don't need a huge amount of market share in order to become a pretty pretty strong business. Uh, the solar as an industry um, as a whole. So we're not talking solar cleaning. Just as a solar industry, will very soon be worth over 350 billion pound annually. So there's massive <coughs> money kicking about in this industry. Huge money. Um, and, and we would like to get as much of that as we can over the next 20, 30 years. So I'm going to whiz through this. Solar energy in the, UK, in the US, the story so far. So basically, you really kicked off with solar over here in 2008. That's when you really started the ball rolling. No surprise that the majority of the stuff that's utility scale is like located in the southwest uh, desert. You are number two in the world for tick behind China. So China is number one. And then you guys over here in the US market are number two. Um, you generated X amount of terawatts over the course of time. Hawaii has got a 100% renewable sourced energy um, bond by 2045. Um, and then California and Connecticut hold the most energy saving potential for homeowners from solar panels. Um, California currently generates over 10% of its annual electricity from solar PV, which is a huge number. To get to 10% is really big, so you've got a lot of stuff going on. Raise your hands if you're in California. Okay, that's good. Anyone from Connecticut? Well, they're missing a trick, aren't they? So, yeah, Connecticut is, uh, is another good spot to be in. So the future of solar panel cleaning, Carla covered a lot of this in the last session, so I'm not <coughs> gonna go through this a huge amount, but the, um, the market exceeded $560 million in 2019, and it's gonna increase over 11% CAGR through 2026. We've got that $1.6 billion um, target. And then you've got various tax incentives. You've got the fact that all your panels are continually gonna get dirty because they're in desert locations in a lot of these places on utility scale. Um, we've got this leaning towards machine cleaning because that's what's gonna clean the jobs um, quicker and it's less intensive on man hours. So that's really where the technology is heading. And for all the reasons that Carla just discussed, it's not quite perfect yet. So we are looking to continually roll out robots. Um, we're looking to limit high soiling rates. You heard Carla talk about um, soiling mitigation. So instead of just looking to clean everything, we're looking to reduce the need for cleaning wherever we can. But we're not doing ourselves out of work by doing that because we're the ones that are going around fitting all of the soiling mitigation um, components. And there'll always be a spot, by the way, in the market for manual cleaning as well. So, this is where we're going to deep dive a little bit into some solar array technical information. Some of it was covered by Cody um, yesterday morning. Was it yesterday morning? It seems such a long time I know, ago. It was yesterday. <laughs> Teach me to stay out, won't it? Um, so you've got the, the four main types: Cody concentrated and monocrystalline, polycrystalline, and the all black thin film panels. He didn't mention the hybrids. <coughs> the hybrids are a mixture of the mono and poly technologies. These are the most expensive panels, hybrids, because you're getting the boast of both technologies, but they are becoming more and more popular um, as the cost of, of producing those panels comes down. So the hybrids are becoming more and more popular. For the first sort of seven years of cleaning panels, I think I saw one residential system with hybrids because they were so expensive, but the technology is moving on, cost of production is coming down as well. So this is a little video. Um, I don't know if it self starts or if I tap it again. Let's see what happens there. You know what? Carla had volume on hers, but I don't have volume on mine. I don't know why. So we'll skip that. But basically, what it was going to show is the photons sit in the solar panels. That then creates the energy, which travels down the cable, goes into the inverter box. It's phrase number seven, if you've not got that written down already, in the inverter. So the inverter is the box that lives either in the loft, the attic, or it lives in the garage, or sometimes on the outside of the property, but not very often. And that is the box on the side of the property or inside of the property that converts the electricity from DC into AC. And when we plug anything in in the wall, we're using AC electricity, okay? We are gonna talk in depth about the difference between AC and DC. 
So shading on solar panels, shading is, this is worth writing down, shading is one of the number one enemies, or probably the number one enemy of a solar panel. So shading really does limit production massively. Um, it's to be avoided at all costs. Can anyone think of um, types of shading? Let's have a couple of people just shout some shading Tree, types out. Trees. Trees. Trees, yeah, okay. Anything else? Buildings. Buildings, Buildings. Buildings. yeah. Pollution. Pollution, yeah. Flocks of birds. Yeah, birds. birds. Lichen. Anybody know what lichen is? Yeah, on solar oh, yeah. panel? Yeah, okay, cool. Excellent. So shading is the enemy of a solar panel. There are, so we're on to what we're on to now, seven or eight things that we're writing down to so that we can speak solar language. We classify shading as two different types. You've got soft shading. Soft shading is something that's always on the go. So when the tree is shading the solar panel and those leaves are fluttering, it's always on the go, that soft shading. Even though it's really slowly, as the sun arcs through the sky, a shadow from a building or a chimney, that is also classified as soft shading because that shadow is always on the move, albeit at a very slow rate. Hard shading is a fixed point of shade that doesn't move. That's lichen, bird droppings, some kids, some street urchins throw sticks up onto the solar panels and <laughs> bricks and all the rest of it. And where that's resting there and it's not moving, that's, uh, yeah, street urchins, people like that, yeah? <laughs> I was a street urchin, so I know what they're all about. Um, so yeah, when you see something fixed and resting on the solar panel, that's hard shading. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated, but I'm gonna simplify it. You can take a photo of the diagram and try and decipher it. I'm just gonna talk in broader terms. If you have a torch that requires four batteries, if you put three good batteries in that torch and one duff battery, one battery that's no good, that torch is only ever going to produce to the amount of power that's in the rubbish battery. So the three good ones don't drag the torch up, the one bad battery drags the rest of the batteries down. Okay? This is how shading works on solar panels as well. So when you have this bit of the panel shaded at the bottom, it affects the next row up. On there as well so usually these are divided into rows of six so if you lose this row here and it's totally shaded you're also losing this which may be in the sunlight so you're losing 30 percent of the power of the solar panel even though you've only got one sixth of the solar panel shaded okay now if you have got all of this solar panel shaded that whole panel is in the shade and all the rest of the system is in the Sun how do you think this one panel is going to affect the rest going to drag it down. Could it also be one to six, three? So the, don't forget, it depends, how, so it depends how many you've got in the string. So string is how many solar panels are linked together, okay? So a string of solar panels, usually a string is between, let's say, two panels, because that's what you're going to link together as a minimum. And then usually the most you have on a string is about 20. Between 16 and 20 panels is usually how much you have on a string. So if you've got one panel that's in the shade, all of those 16 or 20, however many is in that string, is gonna be brought down to the level of that lowest panel, okay? So it's significant, it's <coughs> significant. That is a subject that's worth going away and doing a bit more research on in your own time, understanding how shading affects panels, but that's basically the concept. Strings, <coughs> think torch batteries, always think torch batteries, that's the key with that principle. Can solar panels be turned off? This is a question that gets asked time and time and time again. And people go to this switch here. Does anybody know what that switch is called on a solar array? Okay, so something else to write down in your glossary. They are isolators, okay? Isolators. There are two different sorts of isolators. We have a DC isolator. <coughs> so my solar panels are on the roof my cable comes down towards my inverter. Before it hits the inverter, I have a DC isolator, okay? That stops any power going into the inverter. So if I need to do a repair on the inverter, I turn off the DC isolator, and I know that this now is not, produce, is not got any power inside of it, okay? On the other side of the inverter, you've got your AC isolator. So it might be that you want your solar panels to continue producing electricity and get the power into the inverter, but for whatever reason you've got a problem on the house and you just want to switch off your AC isolator. So you turn off your AC isolator. So two different sorts of isolators. 
they are not the same product either. When you buy an AC isolator, it's different on the inside than it is to the DC isolator. So if you do get into maintenance eventually, you will have self-educated about isolators. But people think, well, I've turned off the DC isolator, I've turned off the AC isolator. The likelihood is they're not going to know that terminology if they think that that's going to make the solar panel safe. But even if you turn both those switches and you think, oh, that's okay, it's switched off now, I'll go up onto the roof and I'll do my clean, is that still live or is it dead on the roof? It's live. Why is it live? As long as light is hitting the solar panel, it's, it's live, okay? It's under load, as we say. Panel is under load. Is it possible for panels to be on by moonlight, do we think? Yeah, yeah strong yeah. enough moonlight, and the panels will produce a small amount of energy. So, fun fact, doesn't mean anything for cleaning, but <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> So here we're going to talk about reliability and failures, okay? Solar panel modules are very reliable pieces of kit. Part of the reason that they're very reliable pieces of kit is there are no moving parts. There's not a huge amount that can go wrong with them. As a result, the manufacturers guarantee around 20 to 25 years of life out of the solar panel. That is guaranteeing not the solar panel glass, not the solar panel framework, that is guaranteeing the life of the silicon that is resting within the solar panel. Now it's highly likely that a solar panel will continue way beyond that 20 year life cycle and it's still going to produce electricity. There's solar panels on space stations that have been up there 30, 40 years and they're still going strong. But the warranty period only covers the silicon within the panel. There are several de failure modes and degradation mechanisms. Usually a solar panel will lose half a percent per year of its performance. So when you buy your Trina solar panel, when you put it on your roof, if it's all working correctly, it's at 100%. You can expect in year two that to go down to 99.5% efficiency. By the time you've hit year 10, you've lost 5% efficiency. Naturally, that's just the, the, the silicon within the solar panel aging. That's just naturally what happens. Um, there are some failing modes and degradation mechanisms that cause them to fail. This is key information you need to know. Okay. Nearly everything that can go wrong with a solar panel is related to water. Okay? Virtually everything that goes wrong is about water. Hi, Brandy. So, solar design and installation mistakes, what do we think has happened here? Anybody throw the answer out? What's happened? Wind. Wind. Wind, yeah. So the wind has whipped around. There's some ballast blocks here, but evidently there's not enough. So the wind's got underneath that system and whipped it around. So it's a poorly designed or poorly installed system. Either the designer didn't install it with enough ballast, or they did give the installer the correct information, and the installer is trying to cut some corners and costs and didn't put enough ballast down. So that might have been up on the roof for three years. Your system designer installer, they've gone bust, or they've deliberately exited the solar industry because boom time is gone, and you're now left with that mess. You can't go back to that company and make a claim, because that company legally no longer exists. That's a mess you've got to sort out on your own. Happens time and time again. Quick question. Yeah. I'm not sure how related it is. When you clean the panels, how high the panels should be from the roof? There's no fixed guidance on that. Because if you get them too high, then it might get blown by the wind. And if you get them, then you cannot clean underneath them and you get a lot of debris. Mm -hmm. And you're going for a lot of intrusion. And if you yeah. get them too low, there's, there's no guidance on that, um, as far as I know, as to height, what the height needs to be. There's various mountain structure manufacturers out there. Um, usually the best ones are the German-made ones. They're very high quality. Um, but they all vary in the height. And there's sometimes deliberate reasons why people will want a solar panel lower to the roof as opposed to higher. But it's the job of the system designers to make sure that they've done all the wind tests Run, uh, they run some software to do various wind tests to make sure that those panels are not going to be ripped off the roof. So that really rests with the system designers. Here's another example of a system with not enough ballast. On this photo here, just that section there, there's probably about £125,000 worth of damage, which is probably about $140,000 worth of damage done to that system just there. And the damage from that system actually spread out both ways as well. <coughs> So coming on to your question about loads, what's happened here? 
Sorry? Snow, maybe? No. Design. Design. So what they didn't account for is the extra weight that the solar array was going to have on that structure. Okay? You got a football game going on there. Soccer, as you guys call it. <laughs> <laughs> Which part of the US was I from then? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Probably more Australian, maybe. Um, so you imagine, though, that you've got that. That's, you've got a game going on, and that comes down. There's some liabilities going on there. There's some deaths, you know. That structure comes crashing down. This happened because the correct weight load tests were not carried out. If you're solar cleaning on that roof, and that comes down, so what does that put the onus on us to do? What do we need to do as the cleaner? We're asked to go clean that array. Turn the load down. Yeah. Have you got documentation to prove that before that system was put on that roof, it's structurally sound? Now, we don't ask that on every single roof, to be honest, because we just know from what we're going to that it's, that it's structurally sound. That's pretty unusual because there's no support structures, are there? There's no vertical uprights. So I'd be asking in that instance, I'd be saying, look, there's no verticals here. Is, can I walk around on that roof? And how much water? You think water's heavy, isn't it? You know, you've got, you've got two or 300 meters of hose on there, and you're putting extra 200 kilograms of water on there. All of that needs to be taken into account. Can we just close that door at the back? Is that all right, please? Thank you. So, <clears throat> just going to quickly go through this slide, but it's important to bear in mind thousands of electricians here and in the UK and across Europe, when there was a government incentive to go solar, all these electricians gone, you know what, there's some money to be made, I'm going to get into solar. So they quickly all got accredited. They're all just running around on the roofs installing solar left, right and centre. They're not interested about O&M. They're not interested about cleaning. They're literally just install, 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 install. And they're doing it as quick as they can. There were supply chain issues as well, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, so there's, there's, you know, the incentive date loomed, the temptation to cut corners was great. Millionaires were made, and as I briefly mentioned, just those people closed their companies, disappeared off. They're all now sipping pina coladas on the beach somewhere in the Caribbean, and your system is blown off the roof, and you can't get hold of that company. Okay, it's happened all over the world that sort of scenario. Great for us as solar maintenance people, which is hopefully what some of you will develop into. Generally, now there's any good quality installers left, just as there's good window cleaners and bad window cleaners in our industry. <coughs> there's good installers and there's bad installers when it comes to solar. In the UK, this is a bit of a queer one, but in the UK, the bad people, we call them cowboys, but I think over here, if you're called a cowboy, you're like the top, yeah? So, <laughs> so I won't say these guys are cowboys, because you'll get the wrong end of the stick. But the bad people generally have left the solar industry now. That's a peculiarity, Steve, isn't it, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So um, generally, the bad people have left the industry. However, you can guarantee that if there's a government incentive that comes back and there's money to be made in solar again, as there is in the UK right now because of energy prices, these bad people are going to start to creep back into our industry. As a result of these dodgy installs, what should we be assuming, by the way, at this stage? We should be assuming that virtually everything that we go to is not safe. That's a really good mindset to have in this industry. Virtually everything I'm going to work on is either going to blow me up or I'm going to fall off it, or it's going to fail on me, and it's all going to fall off the roof. So if you can get into that mindset that everything can go wrong on you, you're going to start to instantly work safely or safer. So let's look at some of these faults, failures, and breakages. What do we think has happened here? That's a very close-up photo of a solar panel. No one in the room is going to get it, but let's just hear what people's thoughts are. Hmm. Okay, meteorite's an interesting one. That's probably closer. <laughs> So this is actually a lightning strike, and what's happened is the lightning has hit the panel, the glass has actually melted in this section here, it's browned all the silicon inside. So let's imagine that I'm at ground level and that, that panel is two stories up and I've got a 45 foot pole in my hand and I'm working away. Am I going to see this? You're not going to see that. What happens to me if I've got a carbon pole in my hand and I'm spraying water onto an open live PV panel? Yeah, yeah I'm going to get a bolt. So, <coughs> that one is a lightning strike. What's happened here? Hail. 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 Again, let's imagine I'm two stories away. Am I going to see that? Am I going to see that? Yeah, I probably, I probably am. I'm probably going to see that. 
probably going to see that. Well, what you're often not going to see when you're cleaning a big rooftop, big CNI job, and you've got your 45 foot pole in your hand, and you just get into the rhythm of you know, walking on the roof, and you're just cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, you just come back and forth and back and forth, and you're talking to your mates, and you've got your music on, and then you have one impact mark from a bird that's dropped a stone on a panel. That's easily missed. So I'm going to see this mess, because there's a lot of it. But when I've got a thousand panels in front of my eyes, and I'm just literally not really concentrating much, and I, and I spray water into a shattered panel because a bird has dropped a stone on there or some street urchin has lobbed a golf ball up there and smashed the panels, then that is again how you can get a bolt. Okay? So spraying water onto open panels so is never a good idea. Are you approximately how much bolt will you get? It depends on how much light is sitting in that panel. Right. We'll come on to voltages. But it does depend on how much how much is how much light is hitting the panel will obviously increase the voltage. Roger. So so there can be so many things that we miss. So what's the remedy? Should shut, shut a valve, turn it off? If if the panel is broken, yeah. So us as a company, okay, let me let's say this is the panel that's broken. Okay. So us as a company, we won't clean that panel, we won't clean the panel above, we won't clean the panel this side, and we won't clean the panel this side. So the okay. only way is to physically do an inspection to know if something's damaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got to have your wits about you in this game. Yeah. You, your staff, you've got staff, haven't you? Yeah. They've got to be alert. They've got, they've got to be switched on people. If you've got, um, so I'll just finish this question, I'll come to you. If you've got staff, um, if they're anything like my staff, you've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. So when it comes to solar, you're only putting your top people on there. You know, you don't want to send a top guy with a bit of a joker because it doesn't, you know, doesn't work out. You just need to send your top people to these jobs. Eventually, you start grooming and getting your other staff in. Analysis that's like a risk assessment method statement, Steve. Yeah, same product, same yeah. same document. So yes, so we have a generic um, job hazard hazard analysis. We have a generic one of those for residentials because pretty much residentials are the same. Where they need to use a boom lift, that's in the same document. Where they're cleaning from the ground, it's in the same document. Where they're using scaffolding, it's in the same document. So we have one document that wraps everything up for residentials. When you're doing commercials, you're doing on a site by site. Site specific is what we call it back home. Site specific risk assessment method statement. RAMS is what we call it. Um, and then the staff, um, we've just changed our uh, internal process and now they've got some software on their phones and they can sign it on their phone. Um, we used to have paper, but we're, you know, in the renewable energy industry, as I said, we're always looking to minimize our effect on the environment. So we're not burning diesel where possible and we're not using paper where possible. Do you have a second question? Or did I answer it, both? It was going to be um, the uh, inspection by drone, like size of the truck. Mm. It's, if you've got that, that's fine. I mean, back home, using a drone is a nightmare. You've got to have a pilot's license, and there's lots of laws to take into it. Yeah. There's lots of laws that need to be taken into account back home. So generally, we don't, we don't use drones. The only time we'd use a drone is if we're doing a, a thermal inspection of a system. So this is where we're going to talk about, do solar panels differ in quality? So we've just had a discussion about installers. Do installers differ in quality? The answer is yes. Now we're going to talk about, do solar panels differ in quality? The obvious answer to that is a yes. So there are many panels that have made their way into the supply chain that are substandard. <coughs> so how did this happen? I'm an installer. I'm used to ordering 10,000 panels a month from my supplier. The government your government had an incentive going on that was making it really attractive for people to buy panels. They were paying people. Now, when the payment dropped, let's say from a dollar down to 50 cents, and they announced that's gonna happen three months from now, there's a rush. Everybody wants panels on in the next three months, okay? So I'm Mr. Installer. I say, hello, uh, I, instead of having 10,000 panels from you, I now need 30,000 panels this month. And all 50 of his customers are all ramping up their production as well. And they're all saying, well, I need 30,000, I need 30,000. 
So instead of him supplying everybody with 10,000, he's now got three times the amount of panels that he's got to produce. These panels come over from China, a lot of them. China actually make the best solar panels in the world, depending on what brand you go for. So don't discount everything from China because some of the best solar kit comes from there. But equally, some of the dodgy stuff comes from there as well. So I'm used to buying really good quality panels from a really reliable source. But because I put too much pressure on this source, he's tempted to go elsewhere to get some panels made. So he goes to his mate around the corner and he says, I need you to make me 20,000 panels for Steve. And he's like, yeah, okay. So he just makes 20,000 panels, puts them in the same shipping container with the same labels on. They've not been tested. They're not from my usual guy, they're from this guy over here, okay? So all these dodgy panels have made their way into my supply chain, but when I'm purchasing, I just think, well, I'm getting 30,000 of the same products, but I'm actually not. And as I'm putting them on the roof, who knows how they're gonna come out of a shipping container? Who knows how they're gonna arrive with me? Who knows how my lads are gonna unpack them? And who knows how my lads are gonna fit them on the roof? So the bad get, mi get mixed in really easily with the good. What responsibility does that put on us? Again, we're thinking of how we work safer. We have to assume that every panel is what sort of panel? A dodgy panel. Yeah, you've got to think. You, you don't know. Just because it's got that label on it, you don't know if it's a good one or a bad one because it all got mixed up in the supply chain. There you go, I've covered the whole slide, yeah. What do we think has happened here? Who said water getting inside? Yeah, water so water's got inside. Okay, I can't reach because I'm only a midget. But if you've, got a, um, if you've got a straight edge and you run it from this corner up to the top of the picture there, you would see that where that browning is, it's not a straight line. The frame has lifted very slightly away from the actual panel, okay? So the seal has been broken. That's allowed water to get in there then. It's likely to be condensation, to be honest, because if that's on, a, on an angle pointing downhill, which we can see it is from the drip marks, it's highly likely the condensation has got in behind that seal. We're on this glossary of terms and things, key things to write down. Here's another key thing to write down. Whenever you see brown on a solar panel, that's bad news, okay? Anything brown on a solar panel is bad news. It's indicating it's either overheating or there's water in there. Anything brown on a solar panel is bad news, okay? So what's got in there? Thank you, Sophie. Water ingress. I wouldn't touch that, no. Yeah. No, no. Any, any brown that we see on solar panels, you, sometimes you get splodges of brown and things like that. We just, we just photograph it, goes in our report. Dear customer, we didn't clean that one because you've got an issue going on there. We just wouldn't clean that one in that instance, yeah. Yeah, because we can see clearly that's an individual panel fault. The reason that we wouldn't clean the perimeter panels is because they're all strung together. So I don't know if I'm gonna spray some water on there if it's gonna react with this one that's next to it. But in this instance, I'm, I'm not gonna worry about that. So here, we've got this section of the solar panel here, which is a different color to the top section. You should always have a uniform look on solar panels. This process is called delamination. It's a sign of poor quality panels. Cheap panels, you get delamination. This is, this is where the coating. The, sorry? The coating. This is where, the, so you've got your glass mm -hmm. on top and then you've got silicon underneath and the silicon is moving away from the glass. Okay, so you've got this separation. Delamination, okay? Not an electrical risk, by the way. If ever you, if ever you did the ISCA training, that's one of the questions, is delamination an electrical risk? It's not, no. Mm -hmm. It'll, it'll still be producing, but your client is not going to see that ever, are they? They're not going to go on their roof ever to see. So it's one of those things that we photograph and put in the report and say, dear customer, you got delamination on that panel. Would you like a replacement? So you're looking to upsell. We can sort that out for you. We'll find your replacement panel. Okay. And this is what delamination looks like on the back. So on the back of the panel, you get um, this is the back sheet. So you can get that effect on the front, and this is what it can look like on the back as well. So delamination, again, poor, uh, sign of poor quality panels. This is how delamination starts with a cracked back sheet. So you can see all the craze in that's going on there. 
So you're not going to see that on a roof because all the panels are likely going to be flush with the roof. What you can see if you get into utility scale or if somebody's got on, a, on their farm maybe a small scale ground mount system. So checking the back of the panels is as important as checking the front whenever you can on utility scale if you're going to do a visual inspection. This, there's various different phrases across the world for this. In the UK, we call it snail trail. So basically, this is degradation and silicon again. Not a major issue, particularly. Um, but what is a major issue on that panel? Browning. Yeah, you've got some browning going on. Okay, so there's something going on inside of that panel that's, that's not working correctly. So it's likely to be overheating. So if I put my thermal imaging camera on that, highly likely that that cell is going to start glowing red at me. Okay, not a problem, you can still clean it, still safe, but it's something to photograph, including your report, when you send it into your client. This is a bit more challenging to see, but basically here, so this, another key <coughs> phrase, this line running down the solar panel is called a buzz bar, okay? Now on this buzz bar, because it's poorly manufactured, the buzz bar doesn't meet where you've got electricity flowing through this bit of the bar, what's it going to try and do to reach that bit of the bar? Jump. It's going to try and arc, A-R-C, mm -hmm. another key thing to write down. Arcing is a phrase that you can get to know. So that is probably going to start arcing at some point. What do arcs lead to? Fires. So there is an overheating buzz bar. So this one has actually got a very slight crack in it there. And it's starting to overheat because that one's arcing. And when they arc, they can start the fire. So overheating buzz bars. <coughs> what did we say this was? Oh, it's on the slide. I was going to quiz you all. OK, then. It's an MC4 connector. What do we also call MC4s? We had this yesterday. As well as call it an MC4 connector, it's also known as a DC connector, as of yesterday. So what's going on here then, it's arcing. How do you know that it's arcing? Now, it's arcing because you've got this brown mark here and you've got the white and the brown there. So it's, when it's raining, it's causing this electricity to jump. If that carries on doing that, that MC4 is gonna melt and it's gonna start fire. So arcing MC4s. MC4 connectors are not supposed to be exposed to the weather, the rain specifically. They're supposed to be covered. They're not a watertight, waterproof connector, so they should always be tucked up off panels, un sorry, underneath the panels and off roofs. They shouldn't be resting on the roof either. That, by the way, if you get into panel cleaning, is a great source of revenue. Always look under the panels, and if all those MC4 connectors are hanging off the rail and they're all resting on the roof, photograph it. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, all your MC4s are resting on your roof. It's not supposed to be like that. Do you want me to do it now while I'm here? Yeah, great. I can either do it now, and it's going to be half price, or I can come back another time when I need to bring all, all my team again, and it's going to be double the price. So in the UK, in a standard residential home, let's say 16 panels, if we're able to access those on the day, it's 400, £410. Pound. If we have to come back and bring the boom lift or the scaffolding and all the rest of it, then it's 820 That job will take Jake, who's my good lad, might take him about an hour to do that. If I send some newbies on there that are just feeling their way around, it might take two hours. But that's still really good money, right? £410 is $450 in two hours. That's pretty good, yeah? One at a time, guys. Sorry. Hands, hands. Let's have hands. Yes? Do you have to remove the whole panel to, to reach an end? Yeah. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends. If it's an end one, then you're going to be able to get your hands under and use um, zip ties, right? Zip ties? Cable ties? Zip ties. So um, you use zip ties, so you'd have your zip tie this side, you've got your connector, and you would have another zip tie on this side, so that holds that, and you're zip tying them to the rail that sits underneath the solar panel, okay? So that's what you're going to do with those. Same question. Same question. We usually have them inside the trap. Yeah. So we have the trap now. Yeah, drop them in there. Yeah. Will that trap gather water? Yeah, it's got from both sides. So you shouldn't be putting them in the trap then. That's how I see them. We, we've, we've been doing panel cleaning for a while now, so, and sometimes we, we need to remove, actually we remove the panel for a different reason, because we get a lot of debris under the panel, mm -hmm. and the water starts backing up, causing a leak. Mm -hmm. 
So what we end up doing is we have to remove the panel and we get to that area for us to figure it out. So the way we see them installed, we don't install them. We see them all inside a track and they suck them in inside the track mm -hmm. and they put the panel on the top. Mm -hmm. also, and they so what's easier for the installer and quicker for the installer to do? Is it quicker for him to bodge it in the track or is it quicker for him to zip tie it? He's going to bodge it in the track. He's cutting a corner, isn't he? Mm. The key thing to remember about these connectors is they're not waterproof. If water is going to gather in that track, then you shouldn't be putting your connectors in there. Good point. Okay. okay. It's, it's a corner. Yeah, well, no, I mean, we deal with, we, we deal with, uh, with leaf to leaf, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's there, yes, but yes, you know, it's not like. Yeah. Roger. Does that MC4 need to be replaced? Is it yeah. compromised? Yeah, we'd replace that, yeah. Any yeah. safety issues replacing that? So. Okay, we're going to get a little bit off track, but I've got to keep to my time. I'll, I'll tell you what I can tell you quickly. If water has got into here, this cable inside of here is normally shiny, isn't it? It's going to be copper cable, so normally you've got that copper colour. This cable is going to turn black because water has got to it. Okay, so when you take the connector off, if you look at it and that, that cable is black, you've got to start trimming it back. Now, depending on the angle of that cable, that water might have actually seeped back 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters, in which case you've got to just fit a whole new length of cable. If it's pretty flat and it's only gone back six, in six inches, you can cut the cable, and if you've got enough slack, then you can reconnect it again. But you've got to get rid of the black. Okay, that's in a nutshell what that job is. These also have a special tool to tighten them up to make sure they're the correct torque and all the rest of that. So there's, there's a little bit involved if you're going to get into that. But it's really good revenue, really good revenue. So we had our overheating cracked back sheet here. We've got two bubbles going on, but this one is creating this hot spot here, just below our junction box. So this black thing, another key bit of glossary terms, that's your junction box. You've got an overheating cell there. Because I can see visually that this is bubbling, what have I got to tell my customer? You've got a potential fire risk, so you've got to replace your module. Or revenue again. Knowing what to look for brings more revenue. But that's also the back of the panel. Is that the front of the panel? Yeah, it's the back. <coughs> so, hmm, let's not get too deep into thermal imaging. But if I'm thermal imaging the front end of a solar panel, I'm looking down on the glass, when the light, when you, when the sun hits the glass and it reaches our eye, you don't just see a circle, do you? you see the sun and the light spreads out across that panel. So your gun is going to see the same thing as well. So your gun is going to see the heat, usually in circular form, which is why you get like, you know when you see on the weather the, um, the clouds and the rain, and it's not a circle, it's a swirl, when you get the same effect when you thermal image it. However, there's no glass on the back of the panels. So when you thermal image the back of the panel, you'll get a clear indicator of what is going on there. You have one faulty cell on there that's overheating. Do you have tools that can do that, or this can be done as many factors or it has to be visual inspection? If we, the only reason that we would be doing this is if a client is paying us to do a thermal inspection on the system. You're not, we don't do this as standard. It's a bolt-on service. How, how do you get that done? The thermal imaging? Yeah. You need a thermal imaging camera. So FLIR is a brand of thermal imaging cameras. They make the best thermal imaging cameras in the world. And we just have a handheld one of those, and we can literally, if the panels are facing me, I can literally just walk down walk down, walk down, and I know my camera is going to tell me on the screen where there's a fault, so I pull the trigger, How photograph it. Need to do this? That's a subject for discussion for, that's a big discussion. Some people, the drone operators, are going to tell you it needs to be done every year. The best practice guidelines for the UK say every five years, and then in other instances, depending on the solar farm site, or depending on the layout of the panels, you do it every three years. So there's variables in that. It's not as straightforward as how often. Okay. Okay. So when it does start to overheat, this is the sort of damage that you start to get. This blackening of the panels, and then if you leave it and leave it and leave it, eventually you're going to get your fire. Okay. And when they go, they go. So you're the fire service. Okay. You arrive on that site. You see all the fire around the solar panels, what are you going to do? Run away. Spray water. 
Right. Would you spray water on there if you're a fire yeah. service? Yeah. <laughs> Would you spray foam on there if you're the fire service? Yes. Yeah. All those that say yes, you're dead. Because there's water in foam. Foam is conductive. Okay? Yes, there's a product, if anybody wants to research it, called PV Stop. PV Stop is a fire extinguisher. It's black. And inside that canister is a substance that you can spray onto a solar panel safely. And it forms a skin over the top of the solar panel, which you can then peel off. It's heat resistant as well. So in theory, you can spray PV Stop onto these solar panels. You can make sure the system is dead, not producing any voltage. Then you can start spraying water around. That's the theory. But is the fire service going to go to all of that effort? No. Are they going to have PV stock in their trucks? No. So the fire service, standard practice in the UK, I'm not sure about America, so I might be barking up the wrong tree here, but in the UK, they're going to just watch that fire burn and the building burn, and they're just going to contain the fire. Well, we're not going to. I was a part time firefighter right here in Las Vegas, and we wouldn't do that. We would shoot eight triple F on that. We would foam it up. That's what we would do, but that was 20 years ago. Okay. Well, the f the f I don't know about 20 years ago, but I know now they're not spraying foam around because there's water in the foam and it's conductive. But if you have a different process, like I say, I don't know about this side of the water, but back home. It'd be interesting to check on it because it's been 20 years since I was, but we would foam that just like an airplane fire. Mm -hmm. We would mm -hmm. foam it out mm -hmm. and triple up. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's the answer. Powder's good, so I've done some fire training, a little bit of fire training over the years, so I know some things, but I'm not a firefighter. Powder, from my understanding, is good if you're pretty close to the source of the fire. If that fire's over there, I'm gonna struggle to, to get powder onto it, because the wind's gonna take it away before it reaches the fire. So, fire is a massive subject in solar, that even now in the UK is a massive topic of discussion. I'm in, but engaged in a group that's engaged with the fire service, that's engaged with how on earth do we deal with this subject of live DC power spraying water around? So it's a, it's a complicated one. But currently, all the fire brigades are doing back home is just containing that fire and letting that building burn. Okay? There was just a very quick story. There was a uh, farmer um, who owned a grain store, and he had about 600 panels up on his roof, and he had a uh, fire going on. A small fire, but he had a fire going on. So he called the fire brigade, they raced out, they arrived, fully qualified firefighters, they were like, that's DC electricity, we're not spraying water onto that, we literally don't know what to do. But another crew had a part-time fireman who was coming, who was actually, his main job was a fully qualified electrician. They were like, he's gonna know what to do. So when he arrived on site, they said, what are we gonna do about this? He was like, I don't know, I don't know what to do. He says, all as I know is we'll contain the fire. So this guy had, a, um, had 600 panels on the roof, his building burned down, all of his grain was gone because all the grain burned inside the grain shed. And because he had no proof of cleaning, because he had no proof of maintenance, did his insurance pay out? No. How much did that cost him? 1.2 million pounds, which is 1.4 million dollars. He lost his building, lost his grain, lost his solar array because he didn't, he didn't maintain his system. That is a great way when you're selling maintenance to force demand for your service. Because the manufacturer, when they sell to you the uh, panel, they gotta tell you the reason why. Correct. When we stop us in our home, that's not possible in there. Us buy the would would you buy it if they said there's a likelihood it's gonna go up in flames? <laughs> neighbors with the loud dog that barks at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the aftermath of a fire. This is a very easy sort of fire for me to diagnose. I know what's gone on here is the cabling has overheated a tremendous degree there and that is that fire is self-contained and self-extinguished. That's that's a cable-based fire. Okay. That's not due to soiling. That's purely a cable-based fire because it's knocked out that single string of panels. Okay. Yeah, probably because of an MC4 resting in the, in the tray. 
What do we call this box? The junction box. What's going on in here? What colour have we got again? Brown. Brown. Anything brown is bad news. So it's highly unlikely that you're ever going to look in the back of these junction boxes. Highly unlikely. But if you're walking on a utility scale, brown mount, and you're doing a visual inspection, you just need to make sure that all those junction boxes are black, square to the panel, and intact. If there's any sign of any warping in that plastic, don't, don't open it because it's likely to be marking inside or there's likely to be some overheating going on. But that's what the inside of one looks like when it's overheating. Can you smell it? I mean, yeah, if it was, obviously if people buy to... Yeah, you probably wouldn't smell it if you were just walking around, but the visual is, is always everything. Anybody, by the way, that, that came here sort of to the convention while you were traveling, when you knew that all this solar panel track was going on, these, these talks, in your heads, did you think it was pretty similar to window cleaning? Be honest, put your hands up, yeah? Did you think it was pretty similar to window cleaning? So it must maybe a third of the room that thought yeah. it was. Is anybody still thinking that? No. 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 It's, a, it's very, very, very different industries, very different approaches, okay? So when we got into solar panel thing, we thought the industry was just like window cleaning. Mm -hmm. Then after the first couple of times on the jobs, we realized how different it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a world away. It's a world away. It's, it's very forgiving from a cleaning perspective, mm -hmm. but you have to be very careful. Not, they don't have to be spotless as much as windows, and you don't have to be as careful as windows, and but you just you have to be very careful on what you're doing with them. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you have to have a special certification, licensing? California is like the worst you know, state because of all the rules, regulations, and mm -hmm. everything that's going on. Uh, to be able to remove a panel, do electrical work, change a connector out, does okay. anyone here in California? So I've looked, I've looked into this recently. There are differences in all American, not just Californian, but all American guidance when it comes to solar. And certain tasks, I'm not gonna tell you which ones because I don't want any liability on me and I think it's down to each individual company to make their own decision as to what they're willing to do. But there's two levels of, of things going on. There's certain tasks that can be done by a competent person. This is somebody that knows what it is they're dealing with and knows what task it is that they're done. You can only become a competent person by having somebody else show you, okay? So, for instance, with the MC4 work, if you wanted to change that MC4, cut the cable, fit the new MC4 connector on there, if you wanted to do that, I'd get, I'd do a day with a solar installer and say, I'm gonna come with you for free, and I wanna watch what you do with these MC4 connectors. You can video that process while you're out on there with him for the day. You can then bring that back to your company. You can rewatch it. You can become a competent person. You can use that video to go train all your staff to become competent people. But there needs to be some sort of in-person teaching. For you that goes out there, you're learning direct from the installer. For your staff, you as the competent person are teaching them to become a competent person. <coughs> so some tasks can be done by competent people. Other tasks need to be done by certified people. So these are qualified, not just qualified electricians, qualified solar electricians. Because as electricians, and then the next level up is a solar electri electrician. Electricians are used to dealing with what form of power? Nine times out of 10. AC. AC. As a solar electrician, nine times out of 10, what form of power are you dealing with? DC. So not every electrician should be out there fitting solar panels because they don't understand the type of electricity they're working with, okay? So, bearing in mind that we have the president elect in the room, is everybody grateful that the IWCA has put on these courses to help yeah. us realise yeah. that there's yeah. a difference? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay, so videos. Let me um, see if I can do this. These are not the death by electrocution videos yet. They are on their way though. So I just want to show you a couple of videos of uh, what can go wrong. not able to connect to the internet can you get one of the tech guys to come and 
sort me out because that might be fixed up. What we'll do, we'll do a, a couple of slides. We'll come back to the videos. <coughs> so why clean and soiling types, okay? This is pretty basic, so we're going to whistle through this. The majority of solar panels were sold under the guise of being self-cleaning. We've already discussed yesterday and this morning with Carla how the solar industry is still changing and maturing. What level do we think we're at as a solar industry here in the US? Infants. We think we're infants still, yeah? Is that fair? Yeah? It's an infant industry still. Still a lot to learn about life, right? Okay? Still need our hand holding some of the time as well through lots of the processes well, there's so no, there's not a lot of standard uh, uh, industry standards right now either mm -hmm. with the installation the uh, maintenance the mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. you know there's nothing the safety there's no standardization across right now in the United States so as as service providers you can't point to OSHA you can't point to any industry guidelines presently that's going to change that's a conversation for next year but presently there's nothing you can go at. So what, what's the one thing you should be going at with people? Is the warranty. In order to maintain your warranty, you need to, you need to be keeping it safe. They don't want an uninsured lot today where the house burns down because they're not maintained properly and they, they lose their property, okay? Is that a robot? It is. It is, you missed the last session. I did. Yeah, we had like an hour and a half on robots and stuff, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, these being recorded, did we say? Well, I know you are, but I'm not recording with this one. My tablet's not in here. Okay. Was Carlos recorded earlier or not doing that? I don't think I don't think so. No, okay. Yeah, oh you did? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah you've got the video Carlos. Maybe you could share that and then we can circulate it around. Yeah. So yeah, it is a robot. Um, to answer the question, yes, it is a robot. They're efficient pieces of kit. They're not the holy grail. They're not the the road is not paved with gold as soon as you've got a robot. They present unique challenges, but they are, you know, it's time and place for them, time and place. So what chemicals can be used for cleaning solar panels? This is another question we frequently get asked about chemicals. What chemicals can we use? Very few is the answer. And the reason is they've got that AR coating that you've heard us talk about for the last two days. They are very easily stripped, those AR coatings with the incorrect chemical being sprayed around. So you need to make sure that any chemical that you're gonna spray is not going to invalidate the OEM warranty, the original equipment manufacturer warranty. Okay, so you need written approval from somebody like Canadian Solar or Solar World or Sharp or Trina to say, yeah, that chemical is good to go on our panels. Okay, you can't just go around spraying chemicals onto panels because you'll strip the AR coating, and if your customer finds out that you've done that, you're going to be in trouble and you're going to have a lawsuit. So What's you need the life to of the uh, the coating of the AR coating. Well. We had all of that discussed with Cody, didn't we, yesterday morning. Um, it varies massively according to the environment. If it's near the coast and exposed to sea air, it's going to be stripped quicker than if it's in the middle of the in the middle of land. So that's a very variable question. Well, but it's, it's got to be at least 25 years, right? Because my panels they just put on my house, they give a guarantee for 25 years, right? What do we say? The 25 years was guarantee of though. It's, it's, the the silicon. Silicon. it's the silicon. It's not the AR coating, right? So AR yeah. coatings so vary in quality. Yes, but it's um, it's not very cost effective to do so. So I've tested lots of these AR coating products and, mm -hmm. and hydrophobic products. The really good ones are too expensive to make it worthwhile doing. And those that are affordable, you need to keep reapplying every six to eight months. So you're at that stage, you may as well just keep cleaning. at all that's the standard form of cleaning so the standard form of cleaning is is RO water um, and DI water rather not RO water DI water that's your standard clean but if it is that you've got some particularly heavy soiling fur droppings that are baked on lichen that's just attached like a limpet to a boat then that's when you start to need, need to use chemicals okay so this is your backup if you can't do it pure water chemicals are your backup 
So the solar cleaner's biggest risk is electrocution, okay? This is the serious part. I don't crack many jokes in this bit of the course. I must confess, but this is um, this is where we get to bits of the nitty gritty. So here we've got an example when it appears on the screen. have an example of a Nor Norwegian fjord. You know what a fjord is? This is where a deep valley between some mountains and you've got the water underneath. So the water is where salt water means fresh, meets fresh water and the tide takes that water in and out, in and out, and the water over thousands of years goes into this deep valley and you've got a fjord. Now that is a process that's repeated often. Okay, and I use that picture that's usually there um, to illustrate that in the solar industry, we've done many things repeated over a long period of time that's led us into a rut that we need to get out of. So certain habits we're in need to change. And this is what I would say is solar cleaners that I've observed over the last 18 months to two years in the US is you've got certain habits here that need to change. Okay, So you're in a rut, you've repeated something often, and because it's repeated often doesn't make it correct. You've got some practices here that need to change and this is what we're going to discuss. So the risk of electrocution does exist on all solar panels that need cleaning because of how they work. It's an unavoidable risk. Electrocution is ever present. It never goes away. It's always there. The only time the electrocution risk goes away is literally when it's dark at night time. Who fancies going up onto a building in the dark to clean panels? No, thank you very much. So, so whenever you are cleaning, you are always persistently, consistently at risk of electrocution, okay? Doesn't go away, as long as there's light hitting those panels, you're at risk of electrocution. We've discussed how there's thousands of installs out there that have been installed incorrectly, and the kit that they've used is substandard as well. So your risk of electrocution is present when you've got a 100% functional system. Your risk of electrocution continues to be there when that system has been installed correctly, but the risk is amped up because there's stuff out there that's not been installed correctly and it's amped up even more because it's cheap kit and it's substandard kit, okay? So you've not got a base load of just a basic element of electrocution, you've got a three tier. And you should always assume that you're working on that higher risk of three tiers. Does everybody understand what I'm saying with that, yeah? As a result, the solar industry does not recognize the solar panel cleaners being the same as window cleaning. This is the realization I was hoping some of you were gonna to come to during the course of the last day and a half, and I think we're there, aren't we? We now know that window cleaning is one industry, solar panel cleaning is a totally different industry, okay? The only piece of overlapping that, that I can think of that we've got is that we, sometimes we use hose, sometimes we use water, sometimes we use a water-fed pole. Okay. Apart from that, there's very other little similarities. That's pretty much our overlap. And as I said yesterday, for the benefit of the people who were in it yesterday, um, electricians use screwdrivers to rewire houses. Plumbers use a screwdriver as well. But the plumber, just because he's got a screwdriver, is not qualified to go rewiring a house. So just because you own a water-fed pole doesn't automatically mean you're kitted out to go clean solar panels. Okay? Just because you own the kit doesn't mean you should be out there doing it. We're gonna repeat this because it's really important that that message is, is hammered home. Okay, so this is our likeliest form of a shock, isn't it, DC, okay? Solar panels always produce DC electricity. In the US, your DC electricity on a solar array, the maximum it's gonna be on any solar array will be 900 volts, okay? That's the most that you're gonna get up to on a solar array in the, in the US. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health states, under dry conditions, the resistance offered by the human body may be as high as 100,000 ohms. Okay, so this is your natural body's resistance. When you're dry, you have a resistance of 100,000 ohms. 
wet or broken skin may drop the body's resistance to a thousand ohms. So if you're sweating in your hands and you've got your water-fed pole in your hand, you only have 1% of your normal bodily resistance to electricity. Okay, so you've dropped from 100,000 ohms, perhaps down to 1,000 ohms, okay? Does anybody get their hands wet while they're out working with a water-fed pole? Mm. Yeah. Highly unlikely you're gonna be working with dry hands when you're cleaning solar panels, okay? High voltage, electric, um, high voltage electrical energy quickly breaks down human skin reducing the human body's resistance down to 500 ohms. So, if I have a cut on my hand, and electricity makes its way directly into that cut, then I've got virtually no resistance, have I? Virtually none at all. And when you've got no resistance and you get an electric shock, what starts to happen to your skin? You start smoking, the tissue gets really damaged. If you suffer a bad DC electrical shock, your liver and your kidneys, they all start to burn, your stomach starts to burn, your intestines start to burn. On DC, you burn from the inside out. It's pretty grim, okay? Like lightning. Yeah, lightning is the same, yeah. It's, you know, you can get all, lightning's a unique one. It's a bit different to what we're dealing with here, but yeah, lightning affects different people in different ways. So DC shock causes the muscles to contract. If I get a fork now and I'm an idiot and I walk across to a power socket and I jam that fork in there, what's gonna to happen to me? Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna throw my arm back. DC electric shock does not react like that. What's gonna to happen to me if I've got a water-fed pole in my hand and I start getting an electric shock, DC? I'm gonna stand there. Yeah, so literally I've got my pole in my hand, the panel's in front of me, I'm gonna stand there and, and the whole of my body muscles contract. So I stand and I can't move. So if you're all watching me, eventually I'll start smoking and I'm gonna start smoking because I'm burning. What's anybody gonna do about that scenario? You come around a corner, I'm stood there like this. What, yes. are, you go what, what are you gonna do? Stick, okay? Company policy, all of our vans have six foot lengths of wood. So that if somebody comes, you, go, you grab that wood and you are hitting a home run with that. It doesn't matter if you break his ribs. He'll thank you for breaking his ribs. Just run up and whack him as hard as you can and get him away from that power source, okay? You walk up and touch him, you're getting it as well. Because your piece of wood is what's gonna protect you. So you're trying to knock that guy out of the park. I think I've done quite well with my American analogy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Normally at home it's a golf swing or something, you know? But over here we're, we're knocking, knocking it out of the park. I've tried to adjust it all, you know? So, um, so it causes the muscles to contract, okay? That's really key. So if you come around the corner and you see one of your guys there, likely he's gonna get a shock. If you're an idiot and you wanna scare your working partner, stand there like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or if you want to get waxed, yeah. If you want to get waxed, so they're like that. So, DC shock is less likely to cause the heart to stop than AC. This is a common misconception. People think that um, a DC shock is safer than an AC shock. You don't want any, trust me. But, but people think, oh, DC is not so bad. DC just affects the body in a different way. Just because it doesn't make your heart stop doesn't mean it's not doing you damage. It's still cooking you, you know? So, um, however, you can have your heart stopped by DC if the shock occurs in between 300 to 500 milliamps. DC shocks nearly always result in burns because the person cannot let go of the source. What's, our, what's going on in my brain right now and in all of your brains? What's, what's going on in there? What source of power are we powering through our brain? Well, just simply, it's electricity, isn't it? We've got, we're all firing electrical impulses all the way through us. No, I didn't mean what you were thinking. No, I didn't mean what you were thinking. So it's all electricity. So when you get a DC shock come into your body, what else starts to happen? It starts to affect your brain. People get brain damage from electric shocks. Okay, neuropathy. I got a question. 
Yeah. How? So, how long do you really have before you have to get whacked? Are you talking about 10, 15 seconds? You're talking about a couple minutes? Run to your truck and get this wood? Or what, what kind of it, they won't rough stop. time frame are we they talking won't stop. about? They won't let but you go. They'll I know that, but to, to help save this person. I do what most people want. The, no. inst the instant, mm -hmm. the instant that they make contact, they're getting that electrocution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now the videos that I was hoping to show, have we made any progress with that or not? Don't know. I want to show the videos. I want. I want to see if we can get somebody in to get us on the internet. So I want. I really want to show the videos. <coughs> That's not because I'm gory. It's because it's the visual is really important for people to see what it can do. So within seconds, you can start smoking if the voltage is enough. So there's a, there's a famous video, it's not one of mine, but it's out there, of four Chinese scaffolders pushing Chinese scaffold, put Chinese scaffolding, why would you have Chinese Why would you have Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> they're just pushing scaffolding around. So they're pushing some scaffolding around, and they've got the hands on there, and they've hit an overhead cable, okay? And they all, oh, I can't do it, because you know Michael Jackson in Smooth Criminal, where he leans right over? That's what these guys, oh, come into my head, that was fast. That's what these guys are like. So they're bent right over, but their muscles in their hands are so contracted <coughs> and the force is so great that they can't let go. And I would say probably eight seconds into that, they're all smoking. Within 30 seconds, two guys are on fire. Um, one guy is very slightly away from the scaff, so it's arcing against him and you can see it moving as this electricity is arcing against him. And there's another guy which actually, his muscles, um, they retracted enough so that he could drop to the ground and he was lying there for a few seconds, then he realized, oh, I'm in trouble here. So he gets up, he's on the inside of the scaffolding, he gets up, and as he runs out, he touches it again, and he gets shocked again. But eventually, he manages to get away. Right. Um, but the video, I think, is about 13 minutes long, something like that. Um, and all three of them just basically So, so that window of opportunity, we have to save that person, is less than a minute? Yeah, I mean, it, you just, just got to react as quickly as humanly possible, you know. Um, and it makes it difficult because if your lad has left the wood in the van and you're on a roof, <laughs> so it should just be part of what you get out of your van. Okay. Water fed poles, plank of wood. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Any kind of so yeah, let me so ask you if you just if you saw someone shopping like that and at a moment's notice you just ran and double kicked them in the shoulder, you're not going to attack them in the meeting. If you want to take that chance, be my guest. <laughs> I mean, I would rather do that than run all the way back to a truck for a piece of wood. I wouldn't want to karate kick the guy off the, without, with my rubber sole shoes and everything. How can I, will I automatically get sucked into the DC voltage? Well, bear in mind that D DC electricity arcs, okay? Yeah. So it might, might hit you somewhere before you even make contact with your guy. So if you're walking into him with a three meter yeah, but the voltage that you're dealing with, it's not going to be like a high voltage line where it arcs right. meters, okay? Right. If you want to go and <laughs> WWE him, go, go get him, but I personally am reaching for the wood. Okay. So it's like a defibrillator? What do you mean? Well, a defibrillator is restarting your heart, isn't it? You're not looking to yeah, do that. That's why they say clear, so you don't have to do yeah. that. Yeah, yes, okay, yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. There is, so were you here right at the beginning when I said about the ISCA and I showed the ISCA logo? Is that the ISCA? Yeah, sure, okay. So in this session, it's all about raising the safety awareness points. And there's a training course we referred back to it at the end. All of the actual safety measures that you need to do in order to avoid all of this are contained within the material of that course, okay? It's, it's actually, I'll show the slide, but it's half price while I'm in the US until Monday. So I've just done you guys a deal. Um, the key thing from that is that you get certification. And that's what's going to set you apart from your competitors. What, where are you from? California. California. So there's a few guys with the ISCA training in California. But if you're not in their area, it's a big state. If you're not in that area, it's an absolute differentiating factor between you and your competitors there. Your ISCA training, <coughs> you've done the health and safety training. You're going to repeat some of this material, but on the back end of it, you're also going to get all the safety measures in place that you need to put there. So it is all covered, we're just not here today. Um, so yeah, burns may require surgery or result in permanent disablement. So
so it's to be avoided. That's good. Can't show my videos, so we'll skip past those for now. So AC shock <coughs> is, is less likely, but it's still dangerous. Why is AC shock less likely to affect us as panel cleaners? Yeah, it's after the inverter, not the transformer. Transformer is still going to be present on utility scale, but the correct terminology is the inverter. Okay. So all electricity is after the inverter. So you've got your panels on the roof, cabling comes down, DC up to the point of the inverter. After the inverter, it's AC. Okay. Um, how on earth am I going to get an AC shock when I'm cleaning solar panels? Maybe. The metal frame. Exposed over head wire. Overhead cable is usually a DC. So that, that again is going to give you a DC. What was your answer at the back, sir? The metal frame. So the metal frame that's attached to the solar panels, that's going to be DC side, isn't it? You're still working pre inverter. So the solar panels up there are producing DC electricity. If there's a fault, that framework is going to be carrying DC electricity. Okay. The only way you can get an AC is post inverter. Now, sometimes on commercial buildings or on utility scale solar farms, always on utility scale solar farms, the inverters are mounted on the back of the panel framework. On commercial buildings, sometimes you'll have them on a, on a wall or an upright structure and that's where the inverter will be there. Now I'm cleaning panels, working away, not concentrating because I'm talking to my mate over there. And as I turn like this, I spray water onto the underside of that inverter and it hits the AC connection, that's where I'm gonna get my AC electric shock. Right. Now the odds of it happening are very small, let's be honest, that, the odds of that happening are quite small, but it's a risk, that's why it's in it. I wanna give you as much as I can give you, you know, everything that I've possibly thought of over the last 10 years is, is in here for you today. So there is a risk of AC if you're just not concentrating and you just spray water inadvertently underneath an inverter, okay? Good. So as we said, I've stuck my fork in the wall, I'm going to throw my arm back. If I get a big enough AC shock, that potentially can throw my arm back, throw my body back. And what have I got here? Because I'm not wearing a harness, I've got the edge of the roof. So I survived the electrocution, but I don't survive the fall. Okay? So it all depends on the voltage, it all depends on the amps that's flowing through there. You're not automatically going to get a shock and be kicked off the roof, but it's a big enough one, you, you, you may well do. And because often the inverters are mounted near the edge of a roof, that's often where they are by the edge of a building, if you do get an AC, that it, it is a possibility. Um, AC shock is more likely to cause ventricular, ventricular fibrillation, which leads to cardiac arrest. This can occur at currents as low as 30 milliamps. AC or DC shock that does not result in death can result in neuropathy, damage to the nerves which regulate heart rate, breathing and other vital functions. So at all costs it's just something that you just don't want to be getting involved in. An AC or DC shock, you just don't want it. Okay? There is a school of thought which is relatively new and it's been investigated, is that if an older person turns up at hospital and they do an angiogram and they find out that that person has got an irregular heartbeat, it might be that at some point in their distant past, they've suffered an electrocution of a minor sort, and it's sent their heart out of rhythm all of their life. But the only time it presents is when they're an old, old person, yeah? Mm -hmm. 10 minutes? Okay, brilliant. <coughs> so this is just a visual of summing up the sort of things that, that can go on. So you've got your entry, he was working with a screwdriver, he's touched something he shouldn't have touched, Electricity will always look for an exit, and it's come out of his other hand on the opposite side. Anybody got any questions just while we're sorting this? Yes. Yeah, I was, I, I, we don't do it, but some people use um, pressure washers to clean solar panels. You ever seen that? And oh, yeah. I would imagine that that's dangerous. Oh, like yeah. That. So you shouldn't be pressure washing panels at all. Yeah. It invalidates the warranty. Yeah. So we got some slides coming onto it. I might actually struggle to get this done in the next 10 minutes because I've got some key information. Does anybody mind if I run over? If you've got to go, that's fine. But So, yeah, yeah we've been cleaning panels since they've been making them, um, but not on a large scale. It's just like, like 10 or 20 a year. Mm. And, our, and our philosophy was if, if these panels can withstand rain, mm -hmm. it can withstand our D 
I told. Mm -hmm. So we've never been scared. So, but what I did learn is to make sure we inspect those panels. So something could have happened in between the last rain and now. So, so now we are going to inspect them. So my question is, what about underneath if some wire came on loose? Mm -hmm. Way underneath that you can't see. Now there's the possibility of of shock waves. Mm -hmm. So I mean, and that's kind of hard to, to visualize. You're at the edge of, of you know, top of the roof, and on my house, I have an array of 56 panels, mm -hmm. and they go like six panels deep. Mm -hmm. So, so you can't you look, can't see underneath, can you? So you're gonna look way underneath there to see, and if water gets on it. You, you so so what way. philosophy are we working with when we're cleaning all panels? Every I mean, panel is dangerous every panel is damaged every right. panel is broken right. so as I say we're not covering it here today but on the ISCA training is all the PPE that you need to be wearing when you're cleaning panels okay it's all covered off in the course okay I haven't got time to do everything here. I'm so really you can only see the damage on top of your panels you really can't see underneath that well yeah the best thing that you can see underneath is all those MC4 connectors hanging down on the roof tiles if you can see all of that that's business for you if you start lifting those panels to try and tie those MC4 connectors to the rail, you might notice there's some overheating on the back of the panel. So one thing kind of leads to the next. Just a window cleaner, I'm not, I'm not a tech guy. I got a question. So a lot of us here uh, do roof washes, yeah. such as bleach and stuff like that. Yeah. What, what kind, of, kind of worms are we opening up um, when you got solar panels up there? I know liability just is out the roof. something that has panels in that area? What's the recommendation? There's no official guidelines on any of that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, as you know, I've run a property cleaning company for 20 odd years. If it was, I would probably say to my customer, if I could control where my chemical is going on that roof, okay. I'd probably be saying to them, I'm gonna clean everything, but I'm gonna leave a meter or two meter perimeter around your solar panels. Okay. That's what I'd be looking to do. Then, you, then you're covered. Then you know you guys are safe. Then you know you're not creating any, any damage to the actual solar array itself. Okay. So that that's what I'd be doing, yeah. So what's the best way if you have a farm? Solar panel farm. Mm -hmm. How do you test every single? Well, I wouldn't, would I, in that case, because there's just 100,000 panels there. Yeah. That's just the so we go, we go back to this philosophy, and this is the key thing, and this is what I try and drum into people. You've got to treat every panel like it's broke like it's damaged, like it's going to electrocute you. And as I said, with the training, with the ISCA training, where all the PPE is all discussed and everything else in there, if you're wearing the correct PPE, it's impossible for you to get electrocuted. Cool. All right? Are you on that roof right? No. <laughs> the, only, the, only reason, the only reason you're going to come across somebody who stood there getting electrocuted, if he's, he's not doing his job right. right. If he's not wearing his PPE, he, he, he might get electrocuted. If you're wearing your PPE, you, you're not going to get electrocuted. And the reason is, I've gone above minimum in what I recommend as PPE to people. So that you need one form of PPE, let's say, to protect yourself. Well, there's three or four different stages of PPE protection. So if you're wearing all four stages, it's not going to happen to you. Okay? So, we're good. All right, okay. So this is a, um, this is a solar farm. And this is, um, this is what arcing looks like. So you don't want to be going and fiddling with that. You don't want, you don't want to mess about with that. That's just a, a nightmare to, to mess about with. I'm going to show you another one, which is this, a little bit different. Sorry about the adverts. So that again is a DC arc flash, that's on a combiner box. So you've got a load of DC cables run into a combiner box. That combiner box will condense all of those cables into one flat cable, and it'll take it somewhere else off down the solar farm. So again, that's bad news. Anybody seen any footage like this before? No. This is, um, so let me just pause this. The next video is where we start to show these electrocution videos, so if there is anybody that doesn't want to watch it, they are brutal, I'm telling you now, they're not nice things to watch, so if you don't want to watch it, now is your time to exit, because you're all a bit, mm -hmm. and you're going to stay in, aren't you?
I know what you folks are like. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a controlled experiment, but it's actually showing what a damaged back sheet can do and when you get overheating within a panel. So you've got your current, you've got your module voltage, um, and we'll just see how this spreads. It's relatively quickly. It's highly unlikely you're ever going to come across a live fire. It's never happened to us. Where we've got the business set up in Ireland and the managing director is on a job in Ireland and he actually had a fire start while he was on um, a roof. He was cleaning this set of solar panels, hadn't reached this set of solar panels yet, but there was an, an isolator fire on the side of the inverter. So he actually was happened by chance to be on a roof when a fire started. Well, you can see it makes a, a pretty mess. So what I'm going to do with these is I'm going to, I'm going to play these and I'm going to explain what's going on as the video goes, okay? So this is an Indian news report. Um, we don't show these sorts of news reports in England. <laughs> so this lady, what's she walking in there? She's walking in water, so she's got wet feet. In India, obviously footwear is popular, is, is a sandal of some description. So there she's had her electrocution through her feet. She's obviously trod on some sort of cable there, and the electrocution is through her feet. So these people are not quite sure what to do. Everyone's having a little look around. And that, that often, to be honest, is the reaction of people, is like, well, what do I do here? Um, you know, it, it's literally as quick as that. So she stepped on a cable. She had rubberized shoes on. Don't think that rubber is going to save you. Okay. Don't think. Well, I've got my work safety boots on, so I'm going to be okay. No. Nope. So it can come through your feet, even through your boots, depending on the voltage. So that was most likely DC. Yeah. There's a bit of lag here, folks, on their internet. Okay, so skip past this one video, but we'll, we'll stick with this one anyway. This is amongst the more nasty ones. So he's walking there um, on a metal framework. He's hit cable. And that, and that framework is live, okay? Look how his body's reacting. So all of his muscles are contracting. It's a DC shock that he's got going through him, yeah? All of his muscles are contracting. He's totally out of control. If you think, if your head is underwater like that, your natural reaction is to instantly just jolt back up. It's not even a thought. It just, your body just reacts that way. Now this guy's getting a bolt. That's brutal, right? So that's how powerful a DC shock can be, is that it over, it overrides your natural internal, it's, it's, not, it's not even instinct, it's, we have internal mechanisms within our body that just instantly work. You pick up a hot plate and instantly, that message doesn't go from your hands to your spinal cord to your brain, back down your spinal cord and out into your hands. It doesn't travel that far. It travels from your hands to the base of your spine and back to your hands. So it's not even a thought. It's an electrical impulse. It just happens. So as soon as you flip back and you start to get your head in the water, instantly you're going to want to flick yourself back up. But the power of the DC is not only affecting his body, it's affecting his brain. His brain has stopped working. Okay, So he can't react. He just physically can't react. He probably is not even aware of, of what's happened to him. He's probably already gone. As soon as he hit the, the cable, he's probably gone straight away. He's not aware he's drowning. This one is the harshest one, um, but it does show some, it does show s some, I suppose, safety procedure why it's there. This one's pretty upsetting because it's a child as well, so just so folks know.
no, well, you know what, it's not going to play it. Maybe it's not playing for a reason, so yeah. we'll leave that be. So what I'm going to say, talk you through the tale anyway. So basically, a boy is walking down the road with his father. Um, there's a, a pile on here, and it must be a transformer box that's there. It's a little bit grainy the image. But the boy, as he walks, he just leans against the wooden post, and it arcs against him, okay? And then he, he's locked in place then. So he stood there, this little lad, he's only about eight, and he's getting a full-on DC shock flowing through his body. His dad is obviously in panic, doesn't know what to do. Some guy from down here runs up with a stick. plank of wood and whacks this kid. And the kid goes on the floor, and then you know people just come from everywhere and they're screaming and all of the distress and everything. Um, it's a shame that that one is not showing from a safety point of view. Obviously, the incident is awful, but it does show that sheer panic from one person, someone else's cool headedness in the same scenario. So, when you're again, I come back to who you're going to send on these sites, you need people that are not rash, emotional guys that just lunge into situations. You need to be sending your professors out there on these jobs. Okay? So, you, I mean, the, the one probably to take home, two I haven't played for whatever reason, but the one to take home is probably that guy with his head in the water. Um, it just shows how quickly these things can happen and the severity and how much it just simply overrides your body. There's no coming back from it. Without outside intervention, you're not really gonna sort yourself out, okay? So I'm gonna have to get a move on because we're gonna, we're gonna run out of time. So your top four execution points on a solo array, 100% right, everybody should be writing this down, okay? So your water fed pole is your first one. That's your first potential electrocution point. You're holding on to a water fed pole. The water fed pole manufacturers out there, and I don't know any of them, so I'm just talking broadly. I don't mean in that hall out there, I mean out there in the world. I'm probably gonna tell you they've got an insulation um, section in the, in the base of that pole. But if you were to quiz them, okay, so will that protect me against the 900 volt straight DC shock? Maybe they will know out there, but the people I've spoken to don't know that. They just know they've got an insulating section in their pole. It might not be enough to save you though. So that's important because if what will happen is it will just basically melt the pole and you're still gonna get your shock come through there. Your second point, solar panel framework. Earthing issues, here we've got an earthing issue. So this earth cable here is damaged. Rats chew through that cable. We've got the video of the rat, dead rat in the gutter. So rats are chewed through that got his electric shock, he's now dead. So if we go spraying water onto that, there's a possibility that we can get an electric shock from that. MC4 connectors are little black connectors that are very profitable, but also very dangerous. If they're faulty damaged or arcing, they can also cause electrocution. AC and DC isolators, this is another possible point of, um, of electrocution. So I need to do some work on the inverter over here. The panel's on the roof, the cable's coming down. I go to turn off my DC isolator, I'm chatting to my mate and I'm not really concentrating, but half of that DC isolator is melted or there's a crack in the case or there's a loose cable. And if the loose cable is underneath, that might arc towards me, okay? So your AC and DC isolators, but to be honest, you shouldn't go fiddling with those anyway. You have no right to touch them if you're just gonna go and clean the panels. You're always gonna work on live kit even if you turn those off like we said earlier, so yeah. Because, yeah, because they're, they're supposed to be designed to be tucked up underneath. Like, I understand, but why wouldn't the industry just transfer to waterproof connectors in general? It's an excellent question for which I have no answer. Yeah, I kind of figured it. Yeah. You would think, right? Yeah. That's the way forward? Mm -hmm. But it no. Cost. Yeah, yeah probably it's cost. cost. Yeah. It's probably cost. Okay, so this is somebody that's had a DC shot with no gloves. Anybody fancy that? No, you're holding your water fed pole. You're not concentrating when you do your DC isolator. That's the sort of result that you're gonna get. Is it, is it worse, do you reckon, to have no gloves or gloves? Gloves. You reckon it'd be worse if you had gloves on? No, I'd rather have gloves on. I'll try it again. Okay, so hands up if we think it's gonna be worse without a glove on. Okay, half, half the roof. 
So this is what happens if you're wearing the wrong gloves. Okay, so you know these like blue surgical latex gloves? You get an electric shock and that melts onto your hand and that's going to be your end result. So having the wrong gloves on, guys, is worse than having no gloves. Okay? <laughs> so again, we've got this message, solar panel cleaning is not window cleaning. We all understand. We're going to leave the room understanding that, aren't we? Okay? So what are the health and safety considerations? What time are we? So I've, I've officially, I'm, I'm over, am I? Am I over? Yeah, All right, well, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to carry on to the end, but if you folks need to go, then that's fine, just go. So, accessing rooms, working at height, man safe, edge protection, IPAP, and PPE. I'm just going to whistle through these subjects. So, the risk hierarchy, I'm going to dwell on this slide actually. I'm not going to rush this one, I'm going to dwell on it because, again, as I've mentioned earlier on, I feel that over here in the US, there's certain things that you guys absolutely need to get right that are not right currently, and this is one of them. From what I've seen, generalizing, you do not follow the risk hierarchy. You choose the cheapest option or you choose the quickest option. And the cheapest and quickest option to get up on a residential roof is with a ladder, okay? Ladders are down here. They are the last resort. You should only ever use a ladder to access anything if you cannot get a mute there or you cannot get scaffolding there or you cannot get the elevation that you need from ground level. It's not done here, but this is OSHA guidance, okay? This is not UK, I haven't brought the UK with me over here now, I've looked at your law and what your law says. An OSHA recommendation is that you've got this risk hierarchy, so when you're accessing a roof, number one question, can the working at height be eliminated? Often it's a no, sometimes it's a yes. Now you've got single story buildings over here in America, quite a lot of them. And the panels are mounted on relatively shallow roofs. That's why everybody feels comfortable getting the ladder off, climbing up the ladder, because the roof pitch is like this. But you're not supposed to use that ladder because the ladder is your last resort. So what can you do? Okay, do you want to hire a cherry picker in every single instance to clean panels on a single story slope roof? Are your customers gonna pay all that? They're not gonna pay all that, are they? They're not gonna pay all that. So how about scaffolding? Scaffolding an option? Might be, you know, might be. Was it, uh, who, so who had 56 panels on their roof? Was that you, 54, 56 panels? Window bright? Uh, yeah, 56. 56 panels. So that's like, let's say an hour and a half, two hours work, okay? So if all those panels can be reached on a single story slope roof, it's worth putting scaffolding up at that stage, isn't it? Put the scaffolding up, go up your scaffolding, clean some, move your scaffolding along, because it's on wheels. That's a much safer process than going up and walking along on the roof. So number one question, can it be eliminated? If the answer is no, what's your safest form of access? Safest form of access will be a scaffolding tower or a mute. If you can't get a mute there, if you can't get a scaffolding tower there, then you need to start looking at ladders. So what's the next ladder you should go to? What's ladder? Yeah, what type of ladder would you go to next? A-frame. A-frame ladder. So an A-frame ladder. So the panels are on this roof here. I'm going to climb up two steps because if I climb two steps up my A-frame ladder, I've got the correct angle that I need to clean those panels. It's going to require you've got a lot, you've got to have a longer brush. You're not going up there with a 12-foot brush. If you've got a 45-foot brush, you're usually going to be able to clean. So I'm two rungs up. Is that safer than being a single story up on a roof with no edge protection? Yeah. Am I still following the risk hierarchy? Yeah. I'm still following the risk hierarchy. I'm looking to reduce my risk wherever possible. But at the moment, the default position for, yeah. broadly speaking, what I've seen for the last year and a half, two years, on the American solar panel cleaning industry, which mainly is coming from the window cleaning industry, is that you guys just pick your ladder off, you put it against the side of the house, and you're up. I've seen even worse where people get the ladder off, they go up, and they take another ladder up with them, and they put one ladder on one sloped roof to get up to another higher level sloped roof. Mm -hmm. Yeah? They also have these straps up there, the driveways are too steep, you can't get scaffolding up, you can't get anything out there. If there's straps there, you actually mm -hmm. bolt into the eaves of the... Yeah, and you attach your ladder to those. You attach your ladder to the safety if there's yeah. no other way. Yeah. Also, how would you do your inspection? 
Yeah, yeah. So the other thing to bear in mind as well is um, I had a thought come into my head and it's gone. Maybe it'll come back to me. Um, but yeah, this this hierarchy, as I say, is an OSHA thing, and I don't see people over here applying it. I just don't see it. And you're all wide open for a fine. If you're an employer and your employee falls off that roof, you will get fined by OSHA because you're not following the risk hierarchy when it comes to access. Okay, so that's really really important. If you are going to go on a roof, is there any way of tying yourself to anything while you're on that roof? Anchor points, that's what you're always looking for. Ladders should only be used as a last resort. <coughs> so here we've got preferred access. Preferred access is internal. If you can't get up there internally, is there an external staircase that you can go up? These are dreams for us, particularly this one. You know, you don't even need to go in the building, get your gear out of the van, and you're on the roof. If not, this is one of our vans. We're cleaning the, that array from our new. With that roof there, how would anybody clean those solar panels if they didn't have a mute? How would you do that? Has anybody got an answer for that or not? The OSHA way or the non OSHA way? Non OSHA way. You know, what, are, what they, are people they get actually a doing? Off of the lower roof, and from the lower roof, they get another ladder to go off of that roof. Yeah. I've seen the photos, yeah? Yeah. yeah. You've seen the photos, but you're not supposed to be doing it. Yeah. Why are you doing it? Send your drone up then. Okay. Send your drone to clean the panels, yeah. Yeah. To maybe access it. So. Those pieces of kit, again, I come back to investment. Carla didn't touch on mutes, but I'm gonna to touch on mutes. If you're willing to make the investment in a band mounted mute, you can all of a sudden access loads of things that your competitors can't, okay? And you can do it safer, all right? So they're really, really, really good investment, really good. This this band cost me, I mean, it's not a beautiful piece of kit at all, it's, you know, it's a little bit rusty, it's a little bit rare, but it cost me £6,000. That van has earned me over 100 grand. A great investment. Six grand into 100? Yeah, it's a great investment. For that entire van? Yeah. yeah. Fixed end protection is the preferred option for roof safety. So if you go on a roof and like this, happy days. What's the problem with having that rail though when it comes to solar panels? No. sun is over here what's an issue shading shading so while that's really good from our standpoint because we're going to be perfectly safe on that roof it's not so great for the solar's point of view because it's always going to have what type of shading going on soft because it's always going to be on the move <coughs> you see these man safe lines on buildings again this is really good if you get asked to go do a commercial clean and that man safe line is not on the roof and you need it in order to walk around safely, what can you do? Mr. 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 Factory owner, in order for me to clean your panels, you need to have a man safe line fitted. Would you like me to give you a quote for that? Oh yeah, all right, that'd be great. You go off to a third party supplier, say give me a quote for this, you put 30% on, and you make 30% of that quote for nothing. It's phone calls, a couple of phone calls, that's it. I upsell everything, wherever I can. I don't know anything about fitting those, but I can send somebody there that does and I can make 30%. If that's a three grand install, I've made $900 for a couple of phone calls. It's, it's great. So are these permanent or you can't make them removable? No, they're permanent. So that's a fixed one that's bolted into the roof sheets and they need to be inspected every year in the UK. I don't know what your man safe laws are over here, but these have to have annual inspections. I'm talking about the line or the, the line. So that's the carabiner that's attached onto a rail that runs along the line. That's detachable and he can hook it onto his own harness. Yeah. So when he goes onto the roof, he clips himself on. No, I'm talking about the second line, the cable on the top. Is that part of the system? The cable on the top of the post? Yeah, that's part of the system. Yeah, that's part of the system. Yeah. That's your safety line. Because I, we've seen them so many times that they don't have the kit. Okay, so what they are then, they're just individual posts. Yeah. So what you could do is attach this to the post. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be but you're very easy. restricted then, aren't you? Yeah. You've only got like yeah. a two meter perimeter to work with with your lanyard. Okay. Roof anchors, we know what they are. They're a really good piece of kit. 
very limited use though when it comes to solar panel thingy, very limited, but they are a safe form of access if you're swapping panels out and doing some detailed electrical work. Uh, MUPE training, anybody got their MUPE license? IPATH? No one. Even in the window cleaning industry, even if you never touch a solar panel, I've had a company for a long time, go and get your MUPE training because that opens up a whole new world of commercial cleaning. It's great. It's really good to have a cherry picker license. Well, lift operators, right? Mm -hmm. Lift operators. Yeah. yeah. We don't call it that here. Yeah, we right. call them certified yeah. lift operators. Okay. Terminology then. Anybody a lift operator? Oh, yeah, we are. <laughs> 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 I just didn't know what a MUPE was. <laughs> so a MUPE, a MUPE is a mobile elevator working platform. That's an international phrase. I'm surprised right. you didn't know that. Actually, that's, an in, that's an international phrase, MUPE. Usually the places won't unless you have it. Sure, sure, okay. My apologies, I, that's an international phrase I thought folks would know, yeah. How long, did, in, your, in, in Europe, how long does it take to get there? How long is the class to get that? One day class, and the license lasts five years, and it comes from IPAF, the International Powered Access Federation. Okay, in Australia, it's a different name, but everywhere ours else. Ours is a one day class, <coughs> it's like a four or five hour class, and it's only good for a year. Oh, is it? They make you do annual training, annual. okay. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, ours last five years, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the card that you get when you've done your done your training. I mean you should I OSHA likes to see it updated annually. Mm. Mm. Okay. You don't we don't even have to have it, actually. No, and this is so this is the point. So okay, I'm on the right slide for you to raise that point. Nowhere in the world is it law that you have to have IPAF training in order to operate a MUPE. My 80-year-old grandmother can hire one if she wants, jump mm -hmm. in it and just operate it, right. yeah? But if you're going to a commercial building, your client is going to say to you, can you give me your IPAF training, okay? That's when you provide it. Exactly the same business model for ISCA, right. the International Solar Cleaning Associate uh, Academy. It's exactly the same business model. It's never going to be law that you need training to clean solar panels, but on commercial buildings, they're absolutely going to start saying to folks, have you got your ISCA training? How yeah, we, how we, what, what? One at a time, sorry, just, yeah. So I made a mistake. We do UNLV, and their safety guy came around. He's checking my guys out. And he said, are your guys certified lip operators? And we said, well, you don't need a certification. Hmm. That, was, that was a wrong thing to say. He's, hmm. my, he's my client, and I want to make him happy. Mm -hmm. No, we don't need it. Hmm. But, but some of them have it, some don't. But for the client's point of view and for your business to shine, mm -hmm. it's good to have it, it's good to show it, yep. and it just makes everybody happier. It's a professionalism thing. Yeah. It's not about law, right. it's not about OSHA, it's not about regulation, it's about professionalism. Right. And ISCA is exactly the same. It's you being able to say to your customer, we've invested in our staff, there's their certificates. Okay. Yeah, we are trained solar panel cleaners. Okay, exactly the same, yeah. same as iPad. Okay. Sorry, SKT, uh, how do you spell that? ISCA. So the website is www. Okay. Uh, so it's www.theisca.org. ISCA. Theisca.org. ISCA. You click um, safety courses, and then you'll see that there's two versions. There's the American version. There's the Californian version because they're slightly different. And then they're half price while I'm while I'm here until Monday. There is a slide for that at the end if anybody's missed it. So here we're gonna here we're gonna talk about it. There's a difference between working and working safely. Um, this guy has got no high vis, no safety harness, no lanyard, no anchor points, the wrong gloves, no electrical boots. He's also using one of these um, powered brushes. So these things can sometimes kick on you. So if you catch the framework in a wrong way and that kicks and you jolt forward, there's nothing to stop him going off the edge of that roof. Those solar panels are located very close to the front edge of that roof. He's off, okay? If it's water-fed pole, that's bad. It's even worse than the fact that he's got this dragging factor on his cleaning going on, okay? Um, if there's any of these photos, by the way, that I'm gonna show now where you know the companies, I don't care. <laughs> um, so here, this guy, no high vis, 
no safety harness, lanyard, no anchor point, no gloves, no electrical safety boots. He's actually creating wet tiles where he stood because all the water off the panels is running down to his feet. Are these tiles pretty slippy when they're wet? Yeah. 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 So he's got a chance that he can go off the roof. This guy, okay, he's on a flat roof. He's more than two meters away from the edge, which is OSHA guidance. If you're working on a roof, more than two meters away from the edge. And that's, what, that's only when you can start work. You can't do any work less than two meters. But he's got no high-vis vest. He's got no gloves. He's got no electrical safety boots. This guy, no electrical safety boots. He's working less than two meters away from the roof edge. He's using a detergent here from his bucket, which is likely to be invalidating the solar panel warranty. The two meters from the roof edge, this is not for a slope roof, that's for a flat roof, or a slope roof. Any roof, any, any roof, edge. any roof works. Any edge. Right, but I thought it's more strict on a slope roof than it is on... Two meters is two meters. An edge is an edge. Yeah. If it's flat or if it's <coughs> an inclination, you're gonna fall. Right, but I thought on a slope roof you need more than two meters because oh. of slope. Not from what I've read. I'm happy to be corrected, but from what I've read on the OSHA guidance, it's two meters. Yeah, but obviously there are caveats with that. There's caveats with that. So if you're going onto a slope roof, you need to think about: Do I need to be attached to something anyway? Yeah, but if you're attached, then the two meter will go away. Okay. So I'll talk UK. I don't know if this is the case back home, but I'm going to tell you about the man safe lines in the UK. You're not allowed to install a man safe line less than two meters away from the edge of the roof. So the edge of your roof, let's say, is here. I have to come across two meters before I can install my man safe line here. Yeah. That's because standard lanyards in the UK are two meters long. So if I install 1.5 meters away from the roof edge and the guys have got a two meter lanyard on, they're gonna go over anyway. Now, you have to also take into consideration if you're on a single story roof and you're on the edge and you're anchored closer to the edge versus in the middle of the place and you're, you're anchored to the Swing the factor. lanyard is going to go over, and depending on a single story roof, you you're going to hit the ground regardless. Yeah. It's all to do with swing factors. Yeah. That's what that is all to do with. You, you should really. I, the <coughs> I didn't. I didn't vocalise it, but on one of the previous slides, there was a um, do harness training, specific harness training at an IPAF centre. That's really good to do. Teach you all about swing factors. Yes, sir. Quick question: What's the high vis? So two reasons, if you're working in a solar farm and your guy has fallen over on a pothole or something, if he's got your colour top on, you're not going to see him. But if, if he's 100 yards away and he's got his high-vis on, you're going to see him. Also, you can get branded high-vis vests, professionalism again. Branded professionalism, okay? Um, this guy is a clown. No high vis, no electrical safety boots. Unbelievably, look what he's got on. He's wearing his harness. It's not attached. No, he hasn't even. He hasn't even got a lanyard on. He's safe. From from a distance, from a distance, his customer, who's stood on the car park and can't see that detail, his customer's going, "Oh yeah, Jeff up there, he's working safe." But Jeff's not working safe because he's not even attached to anything. Question. Yeah. Just came into my head. Can any guidance on anchoring to a to a cherry picker? Yeah, all of that is covered in IPAF training. So I recommend it. Yeah, all that sort of stuff is what they do in their training course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've actually last time I did my IPAF training because I'm a pedant and I pay attention to the detail. There were two things that my IPAF instructor told the class that were incorrect. And he was the instructor, and I said, no, what you just said there is wrong. One of them was he said, you're not allowed to get out of a cherry picker onto a roof, ever. And I said, no, sir, you're wrong. And he said, no, I'm right. I said, no, you're not. And another guy piped up, he said, who's the instructor in here? I said, I don't care who the instructor is. If he's wrong, he's wrong. You are allowed to get out of a, of a cherry picker onto a roof, but you need a very robust... Retractable? No, risk assessment method statement. What was the thing that you guys call that? Job hazard analysis. Yes, job hazard al analysis, yeah. You need a very robust document that proves why you need to do that. And then, I can't remember what the second one was, but there was a second thing on the same day. Fair play to him. 
he went away at lunchtime and he came back and he said that class Steve was right, I was wrong. So he, yeah, it was good. But detail, it's all about the detail. Yeah, but so I remember my training, and I just took it this last year. You're not allowed to get out of the, out of the bus app. We do it, but you're not allowed to get out of the bus. Who told you that? Um, well, we get certified through Ahern. So Ahern I, Ringo, they're the largest Ringo in Las Vegas. So, so we take our classes through them, and and, and I remember them saying you're not allowed. To, you're not allowed to lean over. You're not allowed to reach over. You're so not, leaning and reaching is different. And you're definitely not allowed to get out to unhook and get out or anything like that. You, you can, I'll tell you how. So you wear a harness and you've got two lanyards on your harness, yeah. okay? You're hooked with one of your lanyards onto the cage of the basket. Right. You step out the basket. Oh, I know how you, you could You, do you it. attach onto the man safe. So you're attached to two points there yeah. and then you detach from the thing. And that process is covered in, in the in, so IPAF, the International Powered Access Federation. It's in their it's in their guidance that you're allowed to do that. Okay. I think it's interesting. Now you got me two things. Do. I'm going to call OSHA. Uh, they have something called SCAT, mm -hmm. which is the education area of OSHA, mm -hmm. and you can actually go to them and ask them questions, and they'll yep. come out and evaluate your your, yep. your place yep. for free. That's good. And if they see something wrong, they won't cite you. They'll just give you recommendations to fix it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so somebody mentioned about pressure washing panels earlier on. Can't remember who that was, but yeah, this guy is pressure washing panels. He's invalidating the warranty on the solar panels. Remember that photo that we had early on with the brown running down the inside of the solar panels? If that seal is broken, he's going to cause that process to happen. And again, he can he's put himself at risk of electrocution. So this guy is wearing our friends, isn't he? The little blue latex gloves in his head. In his head, he's thinking, well, I've got a layer of protection with, yeah. with, between me and the electricity source. There's a little bit of rubber there, so he thinks he's covered. But as we saw from the picture, he's making his life actually worse with those, with those gloves. Well, he's 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 across that another house? So this is, this is, um, this is a UK-based picture. So he stood on the front driveway, and he's got probably a 45 or 65-foot pole in his hand, and he's cleaning the panels up on the top roof. So it's a two-story building. <coughs> this guy, no electrical safety gloves or boots, not maintaining three points of contact on the ladder, creates a four risk. And that's an OSHA thing as well. Always must maintain three points of contact on a ladder. Okay, he's not doing it. What else is he doing potentially wrong up there that's not listed there? What else is he doing? What sort of gear is he using to clean? Looks like he's using traditional, mm. traditional applicator and squeegees. So it's likely that he's using a detergent up there as well. Okay. I mean, you've almost got to take your hat off to this guy, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see the burp. Wow. So I've been, I've been to it's Dubai. This, <laughs> this, this isn't a Dubai picture. But I've been in Dubai a few times and you see this sort of stuff going on all the time over there because life is cheap. If they fall, they fall, that's fine. You go get another Indian. There's Indians everywhere and they're just disposable. They just use them like paper towels to build buildings. Yeah, it's, it's not good. <coughs> so residential cleaning safety, we'll go through these quickly. They're easier to clean, convert into clients. All of the safe access rules apply to homes as they do in businesses. Maybe not by law, OSHA maybe does not apply in a residential home in the same way that it applies to commercial. Maybe OSHA doesn't apply to you as a sole business owner in the same way that it applies to you as an employer. However, last time I checked, gravity applied to everybody, whether you're a sole trader or not. <laughs> the laws of electricity apply to you whether you're a sole trader or not. So you have to forget the law in some instances. Don't say, well, it doesn't apply to me because OSHA doesn't apply. I'm a, I'm a one-man band or I'm working on a house that so OSHA doesn't apply. Gravity still applies, electricity still applies. So forget the law, concentrate on physics rather than the law. Follow all your OSHA guidance. Ask yourself, can the panels be cleaned from the ground? As soon as you arrive on a job or before you get to the job, try and plan your work so you go, right, can I do this from the ground? If you can do it from the ground, do it from the ground. Why would you go on the roof? If you need to go on the roof, or you need to access those panels, can I use a cherry picker lift or can I use scaffolding? If the answer is yes, use it. If the answer is no, then you've got to look at 
getting a ladder out but make sure that you pick the safest ladder if you can get an a-frame ladder and just go two steps up do that it's still better than getting on the roof if more than one person is working on the site and you do need to use an extension ladder have that ladder footed as you climb so as you climb somebody should be stood there their feet against the stales their hands on the thing not one hand on the bottom rung and one foot on the bottom rung and one hand on there that's not footing a ladder they need to be square onto it like this both hands both feet um, we've discussed this NC4 connectors great revenue if you can get that sort of work so keep your eye peeled for that this is me and my team putting into practice what I'm preaching okay this is actually a lichen removal job but we erected the scaffolding because the house was too high for us to reach from the ground so we practice what we preach People say to me across here, my customers will never pay for scaffolding. You'd be surprised. If you offer it, people say, you can say to them, look, you can get Joe from down the road to come and he's just gonna go up there with ladders and work on safely, or you can pay me an extra 150, 250 bucks. I'm gonna put the scaffolding up and I'm gonna work safe on your property. Which would you prefer, Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith probably is gonna spend the money with you. But because no one's offering that service, He's not gonna to volunteer to you and say, oh, I'd like you to put scaffolding up, please. It's down to you guys to offer it as a service. Is and there a question over here? He doesn't wanna take the liability either. I mean, it's something that's hurt. Hmm. And eventually it could translate to a loss of it. And yep. It's a yep. specific insurance policy, not NC bucks. So we practice what we preach. We do work from scaffolding, we do work from noobs. Does that, does that tie Sorry, to sorry, you had his hand up over here, yeah, go on. Uh, so what'd you use to take the lichen off? We use an approved chemical. That's the first thing, and then we're using plastic, not metal scrapers, in order to take it off. But that's a whole, probably a whole class of its own for about two hours on how to do that process properly. And there's the lifting to drink the water. No, 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 because the water just rinses it all down. But that's a that's a different subject for a different day. Um, agricultural solar panel cleaning. We're just going to fly through these. So these are statistically more dangerous than any other work environment. As soon as you step foot on a farm, statistically, you're more, li more likely to have an accident or die because farmers don't really care. They'll happily send you up on their dodgy asbestos, cracked fiber cement roof. They're not bothered about your safety. They just want a job doing it and they want it done cheap. That's the attitude of the agricultural community generally. Um, it's really easy to, to go through those sorts of fiber cement roofs. So we got this um, two meter from the roof edge, wherever possible, cleaning from scaffolding or a cherry picker lift. Again, this is us putting into practice what we preach. Now, this is interesting because we've got the robot going. This is my main man, Jake, excellent guy. He could have dropped the mute basket down and he could have walked along this roof. Nothing stopped him doing that, but that roof's got no edge protection. So he stays elevated so he can see where he's driving the robot instead. He's much safer up in there than he is on any part of that roof. He's higher, but he's safer. He's got his harness on, he's attached to the inside of the basket, to one of the hook holes in there, but he's working safe. And this is the thing, just because you're higher doesn't mean you're more dangerous, and just because you're lower doesn't mean you're safer. It's about what your access method is all about. So, robot risk assessment, you guys got your your unique name for that, so you need to make sure that you're writing that document out. Um, also, livestock on farms is a very unusual thing. You know, you don't get this generally in offices and you don't generally get it at people's houses, but when you're writing out your hazard assessment sheet, you need to take into account, are they gonna move livestock around my working area? You get, you get a bull like that, nudge into your cherry picker, and that's gonna wobble you around when you're 20 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet in the air. Nice. Okay. So commercial panel cleaning, I'm gonna whiz through this because as Carla said earlier, these have got a plethora of different environments. Um, that's one side we clean in the UK. Um, so you have to do all of these on a side-by-side -side basis. Again, we're practicing what we preach. My own trucks won't reach up there, so I'm hiring one. Anybody like to have a guess how much that costs for one day? No, not that much. Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred pounds, so about thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a day. It does my client want to spend that money with me? No, of course they don't. Do they have to spend that money with me? 
Yeah, they do. So that hire is costing me, let's call it £1,500 a day. I'm putting my margin on top of that. So for a phone call, I'm making 30%. 30% of 1500 is 500. I'm charging my client two grand a day for that machine. So I'm making margin on the very fact that I've got to hire some machinery. Okay, don't be scared to go out there and hire me because it's profit margins for you. It's margins on margins on margins all the time. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, you've got algae on this roof, very slippery when it's wet. What's interesting here, did anybody spot that that was a plastic skylight that you can fall through? Probably yeah. not. This is metal, I can work on it or walk on here all day long. But if I slip and I fall, I'm going through that. And that is about 28 meter high warehouse roof. And there's nothing in between me and a nice big piece of concrete. So um, yeah, you just all these are hazards that you just need to be very careful of when you're going pricing commercial jobs. This particular building, same one as the previous slide, but this is solid metal. I can walk here, this is plastic. As soon as I put my foot on that, I'm going through. Carla said earlier about arrays that you can't reach with poles. Look how long these are, these rows. You're not gonna reach that with a pole from the top and the bottom. The only way to clean that is with robots. Either that or you're a bit of a danger mouse and you're gonna go walking up and down there and that's, you can't be doing that. Um, so robotic cleaning is the only way that you can be doing that. So, I've come in here today, maybe I've battered a bit of the American working style and I apologise if I've overstepped the mark somewhat, but I believe that things need to change over here because you guys are not following your own directions, yeah? OSHA are giving you stuff that you're supposed to be following and it's not being followed. Um, so I don't want anyone to be offended by anything that I've said today, but I think it's important that you do go away and recognise that you've got to change. Plans are afoot, and I'm not at liberty to say what they are at the moment, but plans are afoot to make sure that the solar cleaning industry is more regulated in the future. So best practice guidelines are, co are coming. Are, they are coming to the US, they're not here yet. But when they do arrive, who's, who's gonna be helping to write them? Yes. The IWCA, they're engaging me, they're engaging some other people. You've, you've not heard that. But plans are afoot for something to be done about this, okay? So when all of this comes in, let's say and it will take a while, let's say the best practice guidelines come in two years down the line, who's gonna be best positioned from, as a business owner to, to benefit from these? Are they a help or a hindrance to your business? Help. Why is it a help? You're gonna already be working in the safest possible way. Who isn't gonna be working the safest possible way? Everybody else that doesn't know it's coming. Everybody else that hasn't done the ISCA training. Everybody else that's not been here today. So don't fear regulation. Don't fear legislation. Don't fear best practice guidelines. They're here to help you. They're here to professionalize you. They're here to help your business grow more profitable. And they're here to keep you, they're here to keep you safe while you're at work as well. That's the most important thing. But if you capitalize on these new safety measures that you should already have in place, your businesses will go forward when other businesses are going backwards. They will be left behind, okay? This is a um, this is a tech issue here that they've got going on. I don't know why. So I'm having trouble I'm having trouble showing it. But if you want to go onto your phones, if you go onto your phones now and you go to all the W's www.theisca so T H E I S C A theisca.org and then click the three lines at the top in the corner of the page and click safety courses. If you scroll down and down and down and down and down on that safety courses page, you're gonna see two different courses. You're gonna see rest of the USA and you're gonna see California. And you're gonna see that at the moment those courses are half price. 
Okay, they're the only ones that are half price. When I do what I'm doing here at an event in Australia, Australia gets put to half price and America goes up. So when I'm in a country, I always reduce the training down for the length of the time that I'm here. I leave on Monday. So on Monday, those prices will go back to full. So if there's anybody that wants to do the training, now it's time to, to get in there while it's half price, okay? So off the back of that, if you do the training, then you also get sent your ISCA training certificate. That ISCA training certificate is valid for two years. We're not gonna make it longer than two years because a lot's gonna change over here in the next two years when it comes to your regulation with solar panel cleaning. So it's gonna give you certification for a two year period. If IKEA come knocking to you, you can go with your certificate, say yeah, you're after three quotes. I'm the only one in Arizona with the ISCA certificate or Minnesota or wherever you, wherever you happen to be from. The other two guys won't have that training most likely. So straight away, you're off to a, a good head start with IKEA. Yes? One course per person? Per person, yeah. Yeah, same as the IPAF. So just because you've got IPAF with one person doesn't mean all of your company is covered. So we're, mirror, we're mirroring that, that model. So ISCA training per person. Individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, individual, yeah. Is this an online deal or is there a, does it matter? Online? No, so it's all online. There's not the resource available yet to have trained off the trained um, uh, instructors of the course, but that might be for future, further down the line. I have in the past twice been paid by companies where they wanted me to go somewhere and do bespoke training for them and with them, obviously that costs, uh, you know, it's cost a lot more. Um, so the very cheap way of doing it to get the certificate is the online. And how long does how long it take? How long does it take to do? About three hours, three to four hours. Three, so three to four hours, there's a quiz at the end. You get two attempts to pass the quiz. You need a 90% pass rate and you get two, I think, no, yeah, I think you get two tries at the quiz. So if you fail the first time, you can go back, look at the material, find out which answer you got wrong, and then you retake the quiz at the end. Can I buy like three at a time? Yeah, yeah, it's all there. So you just add it to your basket, yeah. So excuse okay. me, what's yeah. the difference between IPATH and ISIC? So IPATH are a boom lift training company, okay? They do the boom lifts, we're doing the solar panel cleaning. Okay, yes sir? What's the difference between the California training and California, OSHA is a little bit different to the rest of the USA. So it's tailored for California as opposed to the broader USA training. Okay, California, I've learned this even, I was in California last week for the very first time and I've learned that it's this little country within a country, isn't it? That's basically, the, that's the way to view it, isn't it? Okay, so if you're in California, buy the California one. If you're anywhere else in the USA, buy the anywhere else in the USA one. Okay, all right. New York is its little brother. Okay. So, for some reason it's not letting me show you that screenshot, but that's what I was gonna show you on there, but you've all got it up on your phones. And the last slide is simply, thank you very much for, for coming along. I've run over by quite a bit, I recognize that, but we've had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So I've tried my best just to, while I'm here, answer everybody's questions. I'd rather go over time and have everybody leave the room happy. So is there anyone else that's got anything to ask me before I leave? I'll be back here tomorrow as well, by the way, yeah. Great presentation. So, so just, just on that point, genuinely, it's my pleasure to be here because I'm passionate about what I do, as you've probably all guessed. You know, I love my industry, I love the business, and, and for me, it's about professionalizing it. It's all about raising standards globally. I'm not just interested in the UK or Europe, I'm interested in raising the standards globally. That's why I'm here. I, I, you know, all of this has been funded out of my own pocket. I haven't been paid to come here at all. I'm here because I want all of you folks to benefit from the knowledge, and therefore, you raise your standards, you know. I, we appreciate that.